it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Tonight's story comes with a dedication. This story is dedicated to the author's amazing editor and wife Erica, without whom none of this would be possible. The Devil's House by Positive Tennis 6226 Part 1 The sky was dishwasher grey and the cold drizzle began. It wasn't rain, but just enough that I needed to periodically use the windshield wipers. Oh, I should probably introduce myself. My name's Erica, and I'm a lead investigative reporter. Well, that's the title they gave me. In reality, I'm the only reporter for the newspaper I write for. It's a small town, so small in fact that we don't even offer an online newspaper. There's one thing that everyone in this town loves to read about. <laughs> Haunted houses. They're not ghosts, poltergeists, or flying Ouija boards but the people who go to the Halloween stores that are set up in an abandoned shop co. They buy a bunch of cheap animatronics and turn their garage into a haunted house. Well, it isn't quite like Not Scary Farm or Halloween Horror Nights. Trust me, I've tried going to them. My boss tells me we don't have it in the budget to send me across the country and that we barely have the money for new office chairs. So this was a rare occasion. I was at my desk typing on my computer that was still using Windows 95. I was putting the finishing touches on the big story of the year. Who was going to be crowned Pumpkin Queen at this year's Harvest Fest? It was at this moment that a letter came across my desk. It read, Congratulations to the lucky recipient of this letter. You've been selected to participate in the media day for the opening of the Devil's House. This new haunted house is opening this October. As we know, budgets might be tight, so we're offering a $50 gift card for gas. It's yours to keep regardless if you come or not. Although we are frightfully looking forward to hearing you scream. The address is listed below. Sincerely, Lucy, Devil's House owner and operator. I brought the letter up to my boss. He was more than thrilled to send me there, mainly because it would not cost him anything to do so. My GPS took me off the main highway and onto a dirt road. A little ways up was a big hand-painted sign saying parking, with an arrow pointing to the right. Parking was just a big open area in the woods. There were about a dozen or so cars already parked there. On top of a hill sat a house, and from the distance all that could be seen was the top of its roof and a few spires sticking up. A stone wall surrounded the house, and between the wall and the house was a forest of trees. The tops of the trees were bare of all their leaves. People were gathered in front of a gate. As I walked up, I opened my handheld notebook and quickly jotted, Fake trees with no leaves. Very spooky. Excellent details. I took out my digital camera and snapped a picture. I looked over and saw someone I knew. Frank, I said out loud, and the man turned around. Erica, he said with a questioning tone. Oh my gosh, Erica. It is you. How have you been? I haven't seen you since college. Frank walked over and gave me a hug. He's just a head taller than me, has brown eyes, and isn't too bad to look at. So uh, how are the wife and kids? I asked Frank. Well, Frank let out a sigh of sadness. Barbara and the kids left me six months ago. I was overseas covering the war, and she said enough was enough. There was a note on the table and everything. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I said. So, um, how are you and your husband? Still working at the sheriff's department? No, um, he works as the... I wasn't able to complete my sentence. A man wearing a striped three-piece suit and a fedora hat strolled up to the gate. With a smooth, almost snake-like voice, he said, Welcome to the Devil's House. The gate's opened with a cryptic creak on its rusty hinges. We all looked through the gates, noticing on our left that there was a small wooden shack that said, Tickets, Food and Souvenirs. The letters of each word had little trails of paint under them, as if written in still wet blood. The group of reporters and photographers started to make their way up to the winding forest path. About halfway to the house, the group stopped in a large opening in the woods, where a fire was already blazing away. The man in the suit stood in front of the fire pit and explained, Oh, this is where the main waiting area is. 
The path to the left takes you to the graveyard and the exit of the house. The right path takes you to the house itself, and here is where the scare begins. The fire flared up and a man jumped out from the woods. He raised a chainsaw above his head and revved it. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't say I had peed a little. Yeah, the chainsaw cut out and left only the sound of the fire crackling. The man in the suit shouted, Be gone, demon! Your master commands it! And the man with the chainsaw walked back into the woods. The man in the suit turned back to the group and said, oh, Where are my manners? My name is Lucy and this is my house. He raised both hands in the air, dramatically, and the fire flared back up. When the bathrooms are to your left. The group let out a collected laugh. I snapped a couple of photos and wrote in my book. The waiting area sets the mood with a campfire and trees all around. There are also nice clean bathrooms. Now, oh, come on, everyone. Let's continue to the manor and stay with the group. I don't want to lose anyone. Well, not yet. Lucy said and then let out a devilish laugh. Creepy ambient music started to play as the group made its way to the house. The house was big, with a small, waist-high stone wall with mossy overgrowth encircling the front. A small gate was open, and the path turned to stone as two sets of small stone stairs led up to a small hill to the house. A stone wall followed the path, and lanterns were flickering every ten feet or so. I took a picture with my phone along with my digital camera. A movement of shadows flashed by the windows, and a small light glowed faintly in the center spire window. I noticed a plaque hidden by overgrowth. I moved part of the shrub away, and I could just make out the word Ravenswood. I wrote in my notebook. Three-story Victorian manor, run down and dilapidated. Background music, combined with the overall spooky atmosphere, definitely will cause even the bravest among us to have their anxiety heightened. Lucy greeted us one by one shaking hands as people entered the manor. It was just then that I realized I was the only female in the group of people, which consisted of 14, maybe 18 in all. When I got next to Lucy, he said, Welcome. So glad you can make it. He looked at me, and instead of shaking my hand, he kissed it. A wave of euphoria rushed out from my hand down to my feet, and then up to my head, finally returning to the back of my hand where he kissed me. The feeling could be best described as overjoyed. It's like the feeling of running out of your bedroom on Christmas morning mixed with the panic of going over the first drop on a roller coaster. All well, these feelings happen in just a few seconds. I looked up to see Lucy giving me his best seductive look as his eyes met mine. And I smiled back awkwardly and said, Thank you. And the seductive look faltered for a mere second. He then leaned in and whispered, my, 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 aren't we the strong world one? Got my eye on you, child. He handed me a scrap of paper with the number 11 on it. I walked into the waiting area. Once the last person was in, Lucy said, Good luck. Oh, and one last thing. If you make it out of the devil's house, you'll be granted one wish. And with those parting words, he closed the door from the outside. The two suits of armor that were standing sentry inside the doorway turned on a pedestal, and their lances crossed, marking an X in front of the door, barring any escape. The waiting room had a Victorian era feel. The wallpaper was torn in some spots, exposing the wooden wall behind, and a small table was in the centre of the room. A second-story walkway that overlooks the main room has a large set of stairs in the middle that rise up a few feet before splitting left and right and connecting to the walkway above. A voice came out of speakers mounted to the wall, it almost sounded like Vincent Price. Welcome. This house is full of thrills and jills and is meant to be walked alone. When your number is called, please enter the room on your left. There is only one sure way to leave. Just then the room went black and a scream could be heard. The lights came back on and a skeleton was hanging down in front of the small table in the center of the room with a noose around its neck, with the toes just scraping the top of the table. The voice called out the numbers one at a time, and the person would enter the next room. The door closed behind them, and a few minutes later the next number was called. Frank was number seven. He gave me a thumbs up as he walked into the room. Then, after a while, my number was called. Well, I had butterflies in my stomach, but was excited to see what was coming next. 
Part 2. I walked into the manor's smoking room. It was just as old and run down as the waiting room. The fireplace, which was cold and dark like the rest of the room, was in the middle of the far wall. Two chairs sat by the fireplace, and just behind them was a table with a mouldy old wedding cake. I looked around and saw a small bookshelf on one side of the room. Sitting in one of the chairs was a shriveled up corpse wearing a faded yellowing wedding dress. I wrote in my notebook, oh, First room is creepy yet cozy. The makeup on the body is top notch. Just then a woman's soft, wispy voice called out, There was once beauty in this house. Just then the lights dimmed to complete darkness, and then the lights started coming on from the bottom to the walls, which continued to get brighter until the room was well lit. The fireplace burst into light. The room itself looked like it was brand new. Even the wedding cake was mold-free and looked very moist and ready to be eaten. The dried-up corpse in the wedding dress rose out of her chair and turned toward me. A beautiful woman was in its place. She had a bouquet of flowers in her hands. The bride walked up to me and asked in a soft voice, Will you marry me? I held up my left hand and showed her my wedding ring. Well, first off, I'm happily married. Second, I don't play on both sides of the fence, if you know what I mean. She looked taken aback, in shock, and replied with, You're a woman? Oh, no, oh, no, 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 that's no good. Do you know what they do to women in this house? She handed me her bouquet of flowers, lifted up her dress, and ran to the bookshelf. She pulled a book, and the bookshelf swung open, revealing a hidden passage. Oh, you have to go. You have to go now. Don't get caught and remember the only way through is to keep moving forward. As I was walking towards her in the secret door, the light in the room started to dim. The air began to get musty and old. The wallpaper began to fade, and the cake started to grow moldy. Even the woman and her dress were growing discolored. As the secret door began to close behind me, the last glimpse I got of her was the sadness on her face as she turned into a dry husk. The door closed with a soft click. Hey, lady, wait, I, I still got your bouquet. I was waiting for the door to open and for the actress to take her prop back. That's when the flowers that were once beautiful and colorful were blackened, dry and dead. Damn, how the heck, I thought as I examined the flowers. Okay, well, I'm just going to leave them on the ground. I shouted so she could hear me. The secret passageway was cold and damp, my footsteps echoing along the faintly lit hallway. Hmm, uplighting and scrim may be mixed with a projector. Yeah, that's it, I thought as I snapped my finger in a ha-ha and I'd figured it out. I changed the angle of the light, wide out the scrim, and project a new image on them. The path led down some steps to a door labelled Spirit Room. <sighs> Spirit Room? I wonder what's in there. Probably ghost seances and stuff like that. I slowly pushed the door open. Two big wooden barrels with taps in them sat behind a wooden bar and empty wine glasses covered in dust, and cobwebs lied in the bar. Three bottles with liquid in them read, Vampire Breath, Master Blood, and Mummy's Curse. Behind the bar, a skeleton wearing a red jacket with the name Isaac displayed on the rusty name tag was doing finger guns. I let out a laugh. <laughs> I'm old enough to get that reference. I heard a soft hiss as a fog machine discharged in the corner. The fog slowly filled the room. I took out my notebook and wrote, Thirsty? Stop in the spirit room for a drink, though the staff is not that lively. I took a moment to look around. Upon seeing no one, I stupidly asked out loud, Where do I go? I heard a crack and a snap and turned to see Isaac's arms and hands were both pointing right. He was pointing towards a small doorway with the words tasting room written above it. Inside the room, a table was set up in the middle and two chairs sat across from each other. One chair was empty, while the other had a lump of something closely resembling a man. Portraits hung on the wall, and a wine rack was in one corner. The room itself was covered top to bottom in spiderwebs, like someone had brought in a cotton candy machine, 
Turn it on and let it spray the room down. A muffling sound could be heard as I got closer to the middle of the room. This is something I was reluctant to do as I hate spiders. The lump was wriggling and sobs of help could be heard coming from this spiderweb's cocoon. It was then that I saw the spider. Oh, his body had to be two inches in length. I shuddered as I watched it crawl out of the wriggling cocoon man. The spider was followed by a second one and then another. Oh, the left part of my brain was like, oh, that's just a projection image. But the right part of my brain was like, oh, that's nice, I'm going to run now. I rushed right out of that room and slammed the door behind me. I turned back around and looked through a small window in the door. The lump convulsed in the seat, and then the mass began to expand bigger and bigger until it burst open and hundreds of spiders crawled out of the chest cavity, spilling into the room. This immediately gave me the heebie-jeebies. I wrote in my notebook, Tasting room. Who's doing the tasting? The humans or the spider? Well, that was a cool special effect. I wonder how they got that small of a TV in the door to act like a fake window. I turned away from the door, and as I emerged from the darkness, a huge spider jumped out at me. I let out a scream as its sticky web hit me. Then, with a pneumonic hiss, the spider retracted into the darkness. I examined the sticky web and let out a chuckle. <sighs> silly string, it's just silly string. The transitional hallway took me to an iron door. I put my hand on it to push it open. Wow, this almost feels real. It couldn't be possible though, I mean, it would weigh hundreds of pounds. And it took some extra effort and pushing with both hands to get it to open. The room on the other side was dark, lit only by a few flickering lanterns on the wall. An iron prison cell was against this wall. Three feral looking humans were locked up. Their clothes were torn and barely hung on their bony frames. They made inhuman sounds at me. A small light appeared from an opening and a deep voice boomed out. Meat for the master, scraps for the prisoners. Just then, body parts, hands, feet, individual fingers and some internal organs fell from the hole and into the cage. The creatures inside went crazy and dove into the pile, attacking each other like starving dogs. One grabbed a foot, then ran over to the bars and started eating it in front of me like corn on the cob. Its teeth were broken and stained red. Blood leaked from the chunk of flesh ripped from the severed foot. I took a step away in shock. The smell in the room was that of a full, portable toilet on a hot summer day. A door to my side began to slowly open. On the other side of the door stood a short man. He said, Guten Tag, Fräulein and gave me a creepy grin. Well, my one year of high school German was finally paying off. Oh, hello, how are you? I replied. He spoke in English, but it was very heavily accented. Hello, I'm das Dungeon Master. Und you are? I'm Erika, one of the reporters doing a story on this haunted house. Hey, I know you're not supposed to break character, but can I interview you? Yeah, but first you must do something for me. Well, I guess. What is it? I asked tentatively. In the past, some actors like to interact with their guests, so I was hoping it wouldn't be too bad. Ah, oh, follow me, Fräulein. No one can leave das dungeon with, what, how you say, uh, their innocence. We walked into another room with arm and leg shackles on the wall. Medieval torture devices were laying on the center rack. There was a long table set at a 45 degree angle with rope attached to a log on the top and bottom. The wheels were attached to the log so that as you turned the wheel, the rope got tighter. The rope would be tied around the victim's arms and legs and would be so painful until it ripped them apart. There was a person already tied up and gagged which looked very uncomfortable. Okay, Fräulein. What I need you to do is spin this wheel till das person screams, the dungeon master told me. I know that this could not be real, that the limbs must be fake and the table must be hollow so as to cleverly disguise where they stored the prop limbs. Well, I just wanted to get this over with though, and get to the interview. I walked to one of the wheels, while well, the man was shaking his head back and forth in a frantic no movement. I gave it one full rotation 
I allowed Pop rang out to simulate the cartilage in the shoulder joint snapping. The man on the rack let out a muffled scream and tried to plead for it to stop. Oh, well, Fräulein. You did that with nine hesitation. Okay, we can do your interview now. We sat down at a small table and the anguished cries could be heard from the person still on the rack. Wow, I thought. That person really doesn't want to break character. I pulled out my notebook and began the interview. Um, so, when did you start working for Lucy? Oh, it was 1946, right after Das guilty verdict in Das Nuremberg trials, the dungeon master said. And I eyed him suspiciously. Okay, then. How did you get this job? I asked. Oh, yeah. That one is easy. Lucy was impressed with my work, so he offered me a deal to work for him by torturing the souls of the damned for all eternity. Well, I let out a sigh and closed my notebook. What is wrong, Fräulein? I am answering your question. Oh, you think this is fake, don't you? Ah, uh, rest assured, Fräulein. It is all too real. I need an assistant, and you will do just fine. Join me, and we can rule this land. Well, our conversation was interrupted by divine intervention, as another person could be heard opening up the heavy iron door to the dungeon. I must go. Another victim awaits. I'm thinking das Spanish tickler, the dungeon master said as he walked over to a wall with a variety of torture devices. He grabbed a pair of iron gloves with two long and thick bronze curved spikes on the end. It looked like a tiger's claw. He looked at me and said, This is good for going deep into a man's flesh and with a simple wrist flick separates das flesh from bones. He tried handing them to me. Would you like to try, Fräulein? I shook my head and said, No, I'm good, but thanks. And with that, the dungeon master slipped on the gloves, gave the claws a quick swipe in the air, and walked out. This guy's two shots short of a full bottle, I thought. I looked around from room to room, noticing all manner of torture equipment, until I came across a spiral staircase leading up. I was halfway up when I heard a hellish scream coming from the dungeon. When I reached the top of the stairs, there was a small hatch. I walked through the hatch and found myself in a coat room. After locating the door out, I ended up in a long hallway. The door closed behind me, and the sound startled me. When I turned around, the door was gone. I was left looking at a wall. The hallway had purple striped wallpaper which was ripped and had black mold all over it. The carpet was a bright red, almost like the carpet you might see in a movie theatre. I looked left and right, not sure which way to go. Then I heard it, just briefly. The sound of ballroom music played. It was soft at first, and I started heading toward the sound. It felt like the walls were closing in on me with each step. And just then I turned a corner and saw that I was on the second floor looking down into a great dining hall which was full of people. Part 3 the dining hall had a long wooden table on one side with an absolute monstrous feast. Turkey, ham, mashed potatoes, you name it. All of it looked delicious and fresh, and the smell was heavenly, like it was Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner combined. My mouth was salivating. In front of a stone fireplace, there was a closed casket with fresh flowers all around it, and a mourning wreath with the name G. Hightower. On the far side of the room, there was an open area where couples were dancing in sync with one another as a man played the pipe organ. The music stopped and the couples stood next to each other. The music started to repeat and everyone started dancing again. Something was off about the couples. They were all translucent. I mean, I could see through them. It's as if they were ghosts. No, oh, no, I thought. There's no such thing as ghosts. Looking closer at the faces of the dancers, I noticed that their look of happiness was overshadowed with a look of pain and misery. When the guys picked the girls up to spin them around, I saw that the bottom of their shoes were crimson red. No, not their shoes. Their dancing shoes were worn down to nothing. That was the bottom of their feet. I gasped as the area where they were dancing was slick with blood. 
They were being forced to dance until their feet were bleeding. Inside my own head I thought, this is not really a ghost. I mean, ghosts are not real and ghosts wouldn't bleed. And my husband told me they'd do this. Oh, what's it called again? I began to snap my fingers. Oh, Pepper's ghost effect, yeah. It's just a bunch of mannequins dressed up with red paint on their feet spinning on a rotating table or something. There's a big panel of glass in front of me and the mannequin is below in a room painted all black and just reflecting through the glass onto the dance floor. It's just like if you place an object on the dash of your car and you can see through the object in the windshield. <sighs> right, figured it out, I said out loud. Just then the music stopped and all the ghosts in the room looked up at me. They pointed right at me and flew upwards and away. Well, I was just a little freaked out after that. I stood there looking down at an empty dining hall, just waiting. I was waiting for it to start back up, but nothing happened. I finally started walking and came across some stairs leading down with a red velvet rope pushed off to one side. I got my camera ready to take pictures as I began my descent down the stairs. With each step, the once tantalizing smells and hypnotic brightness of the room started to fade. When I reached the bottom of the stairs by the closed casket, the morning wreath was withering away and the bright flowers were drained of all the colours. The casket sprung open and the half-decayed corpse popped up, screamed, and then went back into the casket. I nearly had a heart attack. I took a step back and then stepped forward again. The casket opened and the person inside did the same thing. Oh, just a robot. <laughs> you had me go in there for a second, I said as I wagged my finger at the casket. When I turned around, I saw the table with food on it. I dropped my camera, which was luckily attached to the sling around my neck, stopping it from hitting the floor. The food, which was once so luscious and smelled heavenly, was now rotting and festering. Hundreds of rats ran all around the table eating scraps of food or what remained of it. The rats began eating each other and gnawing at the remains of the dinner guests. One of the former dinner guests turned toward me, exposing the half of his cheek and face that had been eaten away. It was as if the guest was giving me a permanent half-grin. The jaw was open and a big fat rat crawled out, dragging the person's tongue with it. But the smell was overwhelming. A voice of a Neanderthal rang out. Meat for the master, scraps for the prisoners. He was carrying a large bowl of still steaming hot ground beef. It was pink, raw, and looked like it hadn't been cooked at all. He was tall and big and wore a pig mask along with a butcher's apron. The bowl of meat was set down and the rats attacked each other for it. He looked up, saw me and said, Oh, I smell lunch. And the butcher started walking over to me. I quickly walked back and said, Hey man, it's cool, I'm just lost. Part of me was freaking out, but the other part of me was like, no, he can't hurt us. This is a haunted house with a lot of nightmare fuel, but it's not real. I kept backing up until I heard the whoosh of the casket lid opening up. A wet, cold, bony hand grabbed my arms, pinning me in place. Hey, let me go, I protested. When I turned to see who'd grabbed me, it was to my horror. The half-dead corpse in the casket held me in place his teeth chomping right next to my ear, making a clicking sound as teeth smashed into teeth. That's when the man in the pig mask walked up to me. He bent down to get in my face and gave two sniffs. Ah, fresh meat, he exclaimed. The butcher grabbed me by my long red hair and began to drag me across the dining room floor. My scalp was burning as if it was going to rip from my skull. I tried to fight back, but at my angle all I could do was be dragged on my back. I reached and grabbed the table leg, holding fast until a rat fell on top of me, which caused me to scream and let go. The pain was agonizing and hot tears started running down my face. Once we got on the dance floor, the cold slick blood made being dragged more tolerable, but it was still painful. When we entered the kitchen, I was picked up and thrown into a stainless steel table with one of his big hands pinning my hair down. The table was wide enough that I couldn't roll off. I was stuck. The rat that fell on me was still crawling around on my legs. I was kicking in a desperate attempt to get it off. 
and that's when my foot hit something solid. A towel rack, I thought. The butcher reached with his free hand and grabbed the large rat and squashed it in his hand. The squeaking and breaking of bones was the only sound it made. The rat's guts hit the ground with a sickly smack and with one flick of his wrist he chucked the remainder of the rat next to a meat grinder. He picked up a meat cleaver with his free hand and said, Meat for the master, scraps for the prisoners. And with that he raised the cleaver above his head, gearing up for the mother of all swings downward. I was able to get both feet hooked under the towel rack, and the voice in my head said, Come on, Erica, you didn't do all that strength training for nothing. As the cleaver came down, I pulled my legs up to my core for all I was worth. I could hear the sound closely resembling paper being cut. The pressure of my hair being pulled was gone, almost instant relief, but knowing I had to act fast. I rolled off the table and sprung to my feet. Whether it was real or fake, I wanted a weapon. It could be a knife, a meat hammer, anything. All the cutlery was on the opposite side of the table which I'd rolled away from in order to get away from whatever that hellish thing is. He was standing next to all the knives now. I saw the meat cleaver stuck into the cutting board where only seconds ago my head once laid. Long trails of red hair, my red hair, were strewn about on the table. My hand landed on my camera, and the lanyard still around my neck. I took the camera and started swinging it around like I was some half-assed cowgirl in my first rodeo. I got three fast rotations around my head and yelled, Eat this! And I smashed the camera right into the side of his pig mask, which caused him to stumble backward. His foot came down on the remains of the rat's guts and he fell backwards. He must have hit the power button in his fall, because the meat grinder that was bolted to the kitchen counter growled to life, which was followed by the sound of meat getting shredded. I gasped knowing that I was sentenced to 103 octane nightmare fuel as this person's left hand was slowly sucked into the meat grinder. It pulled him in. First the fingers, then the hand, followed by the forearm. The grinding of meat and bones froze me. And this thing showed no emotion, no pain, no panic. It just kept trying to pull his arm free, which was slowly turned to ground hamburger meat. He looked down and saw that he was still holding the meat cleaver in his other hand. He violently hacked away at his left arm in an attempt to cut it off before he was completely ground to meat. He cut into his own flesh. The cleaver chipped away at the bone. Using his own weight, he dropped down to the ground. The angle at which his arm was bent caused the bone to break right above the elbow in a disturbing crack. Tendons and meat hung loosely from the stub of his left arm. Every beat of this thing's heart pumped more of its blood onto the floor. The sharp bone that broke unevenly protruded from its mangled end. It managed to take three steps forward toward me before falling to the ground. I stood there frozen for what seemed like forever. And my mind was racing as I fumbled to get my phone and almost dropped it. My camera lay in pieces on the floor and was covered in blood. I called 911. 911, what's the address of your emergency? The dispatcher asked in a calm voice. Um, yeah, it's... I reached into my pocket for the letter and read off the address. Okay, thank you, and what happened? Asked the dispatcher. Well, you see, I was attacked by one of the actors of the haunted house, and, um, yeah, there was an accident. You need to send help right away, I fumbled. Okay, we're sending paramedics out to your location. <sighs> Thank you so much. Please get here fast. And that's when the dispatcher's voice changed. She said the next word slowly. You dumb bitch. What? What did you just say? I asked in a shocked tone. Why did you murder the butcher, Erica? That's not very nice to murder people. But no, it was an accident. It was self-defense. I stammered as I began to cry. A cackling laugh erupted from the phone. You just don't get it. No one's coming to help you. You are in hell and you're going to die down here like the rest of us. And then the line went dead. 
I paced back and forth in the kitchen for some time, trying to figure everything out. I tried the door to go back to the ballroom, but it was locked. What did the bride said to me? The only way through is to go forward. There was a door leading elsewhere deeper into the house. I was reluctant to go, though. I looked down at my cell phone. Full bars. I laughed to myself and thought, full coverage in hell. In most horror stories, there is no cell phone service. I looked at my phone again. Where it normally says LTE or 5G, it was replaced with H-E-L-L. I thought about calling my husband or even my mum, but I didn't know what that would do or if I could actually reach them. I didn't want to risk it. So with much anxiety about the unknown, I pushed open the door leading out of the kitchen and entered a dark servant's hallway. It had narrow wooden walls and a floor and none of the fancy or elegant features. This was just for servants to use. Once the door to the kitchen closed, I tried to open it again, but it wouldn't budge. I let out a deep breath I didn't realize I was holding and started walking. The silence was creepy. Well, the background music and sounds synonymous with haunted houses was just not there. I saw a light coming from a window within a door. I peeked in and saw what looked like a doctor's examination room. Someone was strapped into a hellish-looking dentist chair. Not seeing anyone other than the person in the chair, I pushed open the door and stood in the doorway so the door couldn't shut. Hello? Anyone there? I called out. The person in the chair began to frantically wriggle and move. Help me. Anyone. Please, before he comes back. The man pleaded. It sounded like Frank. Frank, is that you? Erica. Yeah, Erica, it's me. Can you get me out of here? Well, I ran into the room and let the door close behind me. Frank was sitting in what appeared to be a dentist chair. His head was strapped down so he couldn't move it. His arms were out to his sides like an airplane. He was locked into what looked like a cheese grater that ran from the shoulder to the wrist of each hand. His legs were in stirrups, like he was about to give birth. His pants were on the floor and a tarp covered him from the pelvis down. What happened to you? I asked, as I was trying to figure out how to free his arms. Well, me and my photographer, that's him over there in the corner. I looked over and saw the top half of a person chained to a wall just hanging there. He was missing everything from the navel down, and his organs were laying in a pile beneath him. Yeah, he and I decided to meet up in the house. He was the one person before me, and he was just going to wait in the next room. Well, we met right after the smoking room in a long hallway. Well, everything was normal. There was a fog machine and jump scares over there. You get the idea. Well, the voice told us that everyone had to go alone. No buddy system. Then we both got a jab in the neck and... I woke up here. Frank, is there a key or something to get this open? It's, it's locked. I don't know. I've only been awake for a few minutes. I'm scared. Please get me out of here. Suddenly, footsteps could be heard echoing down a hallway leading into the door I hadn't opened yet. Just by the sound of the calm, even walk, I could tell this would not end well. God, Frank, I'm so sorry, but I can't get you out of here. I turned to quickly hide in one of the full-length cabinets. Through the slit in the door, I could see a figure wearing a black suit. He had brown hair and was wearing a skull face mask that covered his face from the cheeks to his hairline, but left his mouth and nose exposed. With a smooth British accent, the voice said, Good evening, Frank. The doctor is in. Part 4 The doctor sat down in a trolley chair, grabbed a stethoscope from a drawer, and put it around his neck, rolling up to Frank. He put the stethoscope in his ears and pressed it against Frank's chest. In his smooth voice he said, So Frank, how are the wife and kids? Oh, yeah, they're gone. He let out a laugh and continued on. Oh, the lungs sound good. Not a smoker, that's really good. Now stick out your tongue and say, ah. Frank kept his mouth shut, and the doctor said, Now, now, Frank, do it and I'll give you a lollipop. 
Frank remained resolute in his decision. The doctor draped the stethoscope around his neck. A look of defeat could be seen on the lower half of his face as he rolled himself over to another drawer and let out a sigh. He grabbed a chisel used for carving wood and a construction hammer. He then wheeled back over to Frank. Frank's arm was locked in the contraption and had only a little wiggle room to move. The doctor put the chisel on Frank's second knuckle, but every time the doctor was about to hit the chisel, Frank would move and the chisel would slip, leaving a cut on his finger. Please, Frank, stop making this hard on yourself, the doctor said, as he calmly put the tools down and dug around in the drawer next to the cabinet I was hiding in. The doctor stopped looking at the drawer and stared into the cabinet almost right at me. I wasn't sure if he could see me in the darkness of the cabinets, so I held my breath and the doctor went back to digging around for something and began talking. You know what I used to do before I was a doctor, Frank? The doctor looked back at Frank. Uh, not much of a talker, are we? That's okay. Everyone talks to me. The doctor extracted three large spikes from the drawer. They looked like knitting needles. The doctor leaned over Frank and said, I was in education. I taught kids for a living, but then found my calling. In a swift motion, the doctor jabbed the large knitting needle in one of the holes in the device, holding the arm in place. It went right through Frank's arm, between the ulna and the radius bones. The doctor repeated this twice more, pinning the arm in place, which prevented Frank from moving his arm at all. And Frank didn't seem to feel pain at all, but his eyes were wide in terror. Ah oh, yes, you're probably wondering why you're not feeling pain. You know, the needles I stabbed you with have a low-grade sedative in them. It's something the groundskeeper and I have been working on. Then the doctor calmly picked up the chisel and hammer and placed it against Frank's knuckle. With one whack of the hammer, the doctor popped Frank's finger off completely. Blood squirted out, causing me to feel light-headed in my hiding place. Frank screamed in pain as the doctor pulled out a tongue depressor and jammed it down Frank's throat. Frank started to gag and gasp for air. The doctor removed the depressor and said, See, was that hard? No, it wasn't. Don't be a crybaby. You cut off my finger, you asshole, Frank shouted. The doctor removed a penlight from his jacket pocket and shone it in Frank's eye. Oh, fascinating. No tears, but I have something for that. The doctor went to a glass cabinet and pulled out a small glass vial and began to speak. You see, Frank, when you cut an onion, the reason you cry is the smell mixed with the water in your eye, which reacts in a way that causes a small amount of acid to be created and your eyes water to flush it out. The doctor picked up a pipette and pulled one drop of liquid out of the bottle. So, let's see what a small amount of concentrated acid will do to your eye. Well, Frank screamed and pleaded. No, 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 anything but that. Please, don't, please have mercy. Right before the doctor could drop the acid, the body on the wall began to move and groan. The doctor turned. Oh, I forgot about you. Uh, the butcher should have taken you. Oh, Frank, I'm sorry, I'll be right back. I need to find someone. Frank let out a sigh of relief and muttered, oh, Thank you, merciful heaven. The doctor spun on his heels and leaned over Frank's face. Hey, buddy, we uh, don't talk about heaven here. He squeezed the pipette of acid into Frank's eye then and walked out the door with a sound of sizzling and popping as Frank's eye became liquid. I waited a minute or two before I snuck out of the cabinet and out of the doctor's office. These were definitely the most gut-churning minutes of my life. Now in a dark, cold hallway, I expelled the contents of my stomach onto the stone ground. The horror I witnessed, the sounds I heard, and the screams will stay with me as long as I live. After taking a few moments to regain my composure, I began to move down the dark hallway, lit only by a few flickering torches on the wall. The hallway zigged and zagged, closed and opened, and at some points I had to walk sideways, and other times it got so wide I couldn't see the sides. When I heard calm and steady footsteps accompanied by the whistling of an unfamiliar tune, well, I ran. I didn't want to be an acquaintance of whoever or whatever was following me. I found a wooden door with an upside-down cross on it. I pushed it open and ran in. As I crossed the threshold, I felt something swipe at me. 
whoosh of air grazed the back of my neck. I closed the door harder than I should have, and it slammed with a loud bang. I looked around and noticed I was in a church. It was a very gothic, dark church, where you would see the normal red, purple, and white colour you'd associate with the house of worship. Well, it was all just black. A group of eight people stood around an altar. One was wearing a skull goat mask, and the rest wore robes with hoods that covered their faces. Half-melted candles festooned the area. Everyone at the altar was looking at me. I froze with my back against the door, knowing it wouldn't open even if I wanted it to. I stayed quiet and motionless, not breathing until one by one the figures went back to chanting by the altar. Spill the blood. Must sacrifice. Spill the blood. Must sacrifice. There was writing all over the walls in this place of worship. It looked like it was written in some sort of bodily fluid or maybe a solid. I honestly didn't want to think too much about it. Okay, stay quiet. Sound draws them. I was thinking as I began to tiptoe my way towards the big double doors at the end of the room. Wooden pews with black cloth were lying all over the place. It was a painfully slow walk back, and when, suddenly, a hand reached out from under a pew and grabbed my ankle. I let out a squeak, and the chanting stopped. One of the hooded figures turned towards me, and I could see the face was messed up. It had no eyes, but two mouths, one in its normal spot under the nose, and the other on the forehead, both of which had a set of razor-sharp teeth. The mouth on top was chanting, Spill the blood, must sacrifice. I slowly looked down to see a man with one leg mangled, lying on the ground. He looked up at me and mouthed, Pull me. No, I mouthed back and slipped out of my shoes. I took two quick steps away, and this caused everyone at the altar to stop chanting and look in my direction, trying to figure out my location. I was holding my breath, trying not to make a sound. My lungs were burning and my mind was screaming in my skull. Hey, idiot, you need to breathe or I'll make you breathe. Just as my lungs were about to explode, they turned around. I slowly let out air in little sips until the pressure in my lungs went down. The first step I took with no shoes on, I realized that the carpet was wet. Now that my sock had become wet, I was in a new level of hell with that alone. I began to slowly and I mean agonizingly slowly, make my way to the doors that would lead to my salvation from this room into another. I was just a few steps away from freedom when something whizzed past my head and smashed into the table next to me. This caused the candles on top to hit the floor and the creatures to stop chanting. I looked down and saw that it was my shoe. I snapped my head up and over to see the guy with the mangled leg. He would managed to get himself in a sitting position in one of the pews. Just then, the creatures rushed at me, screaming and screeching so loudly that it was painful. They were on me so fast that I had no time to run the final foot or so to the door. I reached for something, anything my hand could grab, and found a candelabra. I swung for the fences and connected with one of the abominations with a satisfying crunch to its arm. The other six surrounded and swarmed all over me. They grabbed my legs and arms. The arm with the candelabra remained free, and I was swinging it wildly without hitting anything. Then the chanting resumed. Spill the blood, must sacrifice. Spill the blood, must sacrifice. Faster and faster the chanting went as I was being carried to the altar to be sacrificed. The one with the goat mask blew into an Aztec death whistle, the sound of which caused me to go into full panic mode. I bucked, squirmed, and kicked, trying to break free from these creatures restraining me. Right before I got to the altar, I saw the guy sitting in the pew with a smirk on his face like he'd won. Well, if I was going out, I wanted to give this as a going-away gift. So with all the strength I could muster, I chucked the candelabra at him, and it hit him square in his smug face. In my mind, I was thinking, hell yeah, two points. All of a sudden, I was in freefall. I hit the ground with a loud thud, and the wind was knocked out of me. I was gasping for air when the creatures surrounding me started to chant. Blood has been spilled. They must be sacrificed. Blood has been spilled. They must be sacrificed. I looked up and the guy sitting in the pew had a very wicked nosebleed. 
Wait, what? No, 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 wait! The man screamed as they picked him up and carried him over to the altar. I sat up and walked over to the door. At this point, the creatures had no interest in me. I opened the doors, flipped this room the bird, and walked out. My hopes were dashed and my legs gave out as I collapsed back into the starting room. The skeleton was still hanging from the rafters. The knight's lances were still blocking the door. Just because I could, though, I tried to open the main doors to the outside. And they were locked. The door to the left was locked. <sighs> of course, I was already there, I thought, and I went to the right side of the main stairs and tried those doors and opened them. I stood in the doorway holding them open shocked by what I saw. It was the Grand Hall. All the food was on the ground, as well as what looked like a fresh body missing an arm, and entrails hanging out as the rats greedily fed upon them. The butcher was on top of the table, laying on his back as the doctor was sewing up a new arm on him. The dungeon master was assisting the doctor, mostly trying to keep the rats from eating out of the open wound that was being sewn shut. The dungeon master looked up his eyes growing wide in excitement, and said, Ah, oh, Fräulein, you are back. He turned to the doctor. Doctor, I can finish up here. Won't you go get her, yeah? Ah, with pleasure, DM, replied the doctor as he stood up. He started walking towards me and pulled out a scalpel. I'm going to cut a hole, and I'm going to make it wide. Wait, doctor, the dungeon master shouted. The doctor stopped and lifted one finger in my direction to say, wait a moment, and turned towards the dungeon master. What is it, DM? I'm kind of in the middle of something. As he gestured towards me. I was frozen. My flight or fight response had been burned out after everything I'd encountered so far, and a small part of me was completely fascinated by the fact that two demons were actually arguing over something. Please don't cut this one. I found her as my apprentice in Das Dungeon. In anger, the doctor threw the scalpel behind him. It slid along the floor to my feet, and I picked it up as a weapon. The doctor pulled out a syringe with a green glowing liquid inside. Ah, fine. But you owe me one. Ah, oh, sure, sure. When World War Three happens, I'll make sure we are on Das same sides this time. Now, get Das Fräulein. The doctor looked at me with a sly grin. Come here. Time for your medicine. I took one step back and let the door close. I turned and ran up the stairs, bolted to the left, and ran down a long hallway. I picked a door at random and ducked inside. Part 5 it turned out to be the master bedroom, which consisted of valuable hardwood floors, hand-carved windowsills, and a stone fireplace with a stone chimney going all the way up to the 11-foot-high ceiling. There was a king-size bed against one of the walls. A person sat on the bed, crying. I held up the scampel and croaked out. Are you real? The man turned to me as he was crying blood, accompanied by a thousand-yard stare. He spoke in a soft voice. That of someone who's been mentally broken. Yeah, I am. I was with a group of reporters, and the same as you. Oh my gosh, what happened to you? I asked in a sympathetic tone. The doctor got me. He jabbed me with this blue liquid. I started seeing things. He called it his good night cocktail. Every time I close my eyes and every time I blink, I see things. Things I know are not true replaying over and over again. My wife cheating on me, my house on fire with my kids slapping the window trying to get out while they're burning alive, screaming that it's my fault. Oh, my dog viciously attacking me when I bend down to pet him. Oh, and so much more. I can't get it to stop. I tried cutting my eyelids off with this kid's safety scissors I found, but it didn't help. Nothing does. And to my shock, his eyelids were mangled. One was missing half the lid, the other was hanging on only by a thin strip of skin. When he blinked, his eyes squirted blood and he cried out in pain. What about the windows? Can we open it or try to smash it out? I asked frantically as I dashed over to the window and tried to open it. No, you can't. I tried. Hey, how do you think I broke the scissors? That window is bulletproof or something. Couldn't even get the glass to chip. 
The man looked down and his eyes rested on the scalpel I was holding. His voice changed from one of sadness to anger. Hey, give me the knife, he growled. I spun around. No, no, you find your own weapon, I said, as he stood up and I noticed that he had a very intimidating figure. I said, give me the knife, lady, or I'll use it on you and then on myself. So give it to me. He took a few monstrous steps towards me. I held the scalpel in both hands with the blade pointed at him. The little blade was sharp, but I felt it wouldn't do much to stop this man. Stay back. I'm warning you. As I backed away, I did my best to keep the shakiness out of my voice, but I failed miserably. Last chance to put it down and walk away before I put you down. So I put the scalpel down on the dresser with shaking hands and backed further away. He calmly walked over and picked it up. He looked at me, relieved, as he nodded to something behind me. The door to get out of this room is behind you. He said this in a calm tone, as if he just made peace with everything. Not wanting to take my eyes off him, I walked backwards until my back hit the door. I reached behind me for a door handle and panicked a little when I couldn't find it. Then my hand brushed against something smooth. I turned the handle and walked in. The last thing I saw as I closed the door was the man's long shadows on the wall. He plunged something into his forearm near his wrist and pulled it all the way to his elbow. I pressed my head against the door and slowly turned, not wanting to see what new horror awaited me. To my surprise, it was a bathroom. Not a dirty, disheveled bathroom as one would expect to see either. And this bathroom was spotless. Clean white stone floors, a whirlpool tub and a toilet with gold trim. There was a sea foam green countertop with two sinks. The washer and dryer were hidden in the corner. This room was an oasis in an endless desert. I checked every cabinet, shelf, nook and cranny. It was all normal. I took my shoe off, put my wet sock in the dryer and turned it on. Fifteen minutes later I had a warm, dry sock. I just finished up doing my business and was washing my hands when the lights flickered. Oh no, 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 I groaned. A wet black rope of hair that smelled like sewer snaked its way out of the sink drain and shot towards my face. I was able to dive out of the way just in time. It then retreated back into the sink drain. The smell of copper became noticeable very quickly. Blood, thick and sticky, began to overflow out of the sink and onto the floor. The whirlpool tub turned on, producing red foam as the bathtub began to churn the blood. It reminded me of the world's biggest bowl of tomato soup. A loud bang got my attention as the door for both the washer and dryer blew off their hinges and slammed into the wall. Large amounts of blood were coming out of the washer and dryer now, and it was flowing with the same amount of force as jets at the top of a water slide. The room quickly began to fill. It was over the tops of my shoes and then up to my knees. By the time I made it to the door leading out, it was up to my waist and then my chest. It was like being in a hot shower. The door wouldn't open. The pressure from the blood was holding the door shut. In an instant, it was up to my chin, and I was treading blood, trying to stay afloat. My head now bumped the ceiling. I took my last gulps of air before slipping below the surface. I couldn't see more than a foot in front of me. Everything was red and warm. I heard a groan and a loud crack, and was suddenly sucked out of the room and out into the hallway. The door lost its battle with the rising pressure in the room and broke into two. I came to a stop sitting on the floor with my legs out in front of me. I began gasping for air and I started to laugh uncontrollably. It was a crazy person's laugh. This went on for a while until the last of my giggles left and my sanity slowly returned. I stood up and thought to myself, Gee, talk about high blood pressure. I was still dripping in blood as I made my way to the end of the hallway where a single door stood. I took a deep breath, opened the door, and walked in. It was a child's room. Toys and games were all over the floor. The voice of a small girl called out to me. Do you want to be my new mommy? I looked up to see a young girl, maybe six years old. She was swinging from a swing attached to the ceiling. Something was off about the swing, but I couldn't tell from this distance what it was. The child spoke again. 
play with me forever and ever, and never have a bedtime. Oh, listen, I'm just trying to get out of here. It's a tempting offer, but I'm going to have to say no. Well, this angered the little girl. You know what happened to the last person who didn't want to be my daddy and play with me forever? I turned him into this swing, and now he has to play with me. She began to laugh, and with every passing second her voice became deeper and scarier. She leapt from the swing and stuck to the wall, crawling like a cockroach. The swing fell down in front of me. To my disbelief, it was made out of human skin and bones, and the skin was stretched tightly to use as a rope and the bones as the seat. The little girl said, I'll make you into a slide or maybe a new table for tea parties. I ran to the next door, but before I could open it, the girl appeared upside down in front of the door, giggling. <laughs> you can't leave yet. Well, after the day I'd had, I was getting sick of all this. I twisted at the waist and gave the hardest punch I could throw right at the side of her head. She went flying to the ground and began to sob in pain. Why did you hit me? She said in her little kid voice. For a split second, I felt bad and panicked. Did I really just punch a kid in the face? Then I remembered that this was hell. I blew air out of my nose, opened the door and said, oh, You'll be fine, you're not even a real child. Her demon voice came out screaming and she lunged at me, her nails now turned into sharp daggers. I'll kill you. I slammed the door in her face and was rewarded with a loud thud as she smacked into the other side. With this newfound badassness, I began walking down the hallway with my head held high. That is, until I reached the library. The next door I tried led me into the library. It was darkly lit with oil lamps on the wall. There was a lantern sitting on the table. I took the lantern and began to walk down rows upon rows of books. I held the lantern and started looking at the titles. Jeff the Killer, Slender Man, Russian Sleep Experiment and the Lord of the Feast, to name just a few. I heard a familiar voice coming from a different part of the room. I put my head slowly around the corner of the bookshelf and saw the doctor sitting in a very old, comfy-looking chair. His half-skull mask reflected the glow of the fire in the fireplace next to him. An old tape recorder was going. It was the kind with the big tape reels on both sides. An old radio microphone sat next to him on a small table. The doctor had a book in his hands. I couldn't make out the title. The doctor said, But until the next time, my dear friends, have very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. He had a button on the tape recorder gingerly, set the book down, turned towards me and said, Well, 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 Miss Erica, is it? You've caused quite a little ruckus down here, haven't you? And all the courage I gained instantly drained from me. I took off running as fast as I could. I turned back to see him rise from his chair and slowly walk towards me. His voice echoed off the walls. Ah, oh, Miss Erica, this chamber has no windows and no doors, so I offer you this challenge to find a way out. I thought to myself, is this guy really quoting the haunted mansion? Come on, be a tad bit more original. I turned a corner and the doctor appeared in front of me. He smoothly pulled out his syringe with the green liquid inside. Ah, uh, you see, darling, the devil might run hell, but this room is mine. I know all the ins and outs. Now, be a good girl and take your shot. He lunged at me trying to drive the long needle home into my soft flesh. I grabbed his wrist with the syringe in it and forced the needle away from me and grabbed his other arm. We were at a deadlock. With my adrenaline pumping, I was able to keep him at bay, but I was starting to tire. Now, now, the dungeon master wants you to take your medicine, the doctor said as we struggled back and forth. I shouted at him, I don't have insurance. I cocked my head back and landed an almost perfect headbutt right into the doctor's nose. The doctor dropped his syringe and staggered back in pain. I picked it up. It was ice cold. I slammed the heavy gauge needle into the doctor's thigh, and he looked down in surprise. Hey, what the... was all he was able to get out as I depressed the plunger. 
and the doctor instantly collapsed to the ground. I tried to stand, but it was difficult. It was like my legs weren't understanding what I wanted them to do. I remembered what my husband had told me once. A headbutt and a knife fight are the same. No one wins, it's just different degrees of losing. I fell to the ground. As I lay there, I looked up and saw a string hanging down from the ceiling. When I was finally able to stand, I searched the doctor's pockets to try and find anything useful. Unfortunately, there was nothing. Pulling over a chair, I was just able to reach the string. I reached up and gave it a solid pull. A square formed in the ceiling, and the square part of the ceiling swung down and a ladder unfolded all the way to the ground. I let the ladder sit there, not wanting to climb it into the attic. I looked around, but it was just as the doctor said, no doors to open. With a deep breath and much trepidation, I began climbing up into the attic. As I got closer to the top, the sound of a slowly thudding heartbeat was getting louder and louder. Dust and cobwebs were everywhere, and a single light bulb hung in the middle of the room. Once inside, the attic door retracted automatically and closed with a loud bang. It was cold and everything in the room was uneasy. I found a mannequin on the ground with a hangman's noose around its neck. Damp cardboard boxes were pushed up against the wall, full of paper, nothing useful at all. The single hanging light bulb began to slowly swing back and forth, though no air movement was noticeable. At the far end, there was an open window. It was small, but just big enough for someone to get out. Oh, freedom, I thought. I looked down and saw that I was three stories up, and then I had an idea. I grabbed the noose and tied one end to the rafter and tossed the rest out of the window. I did some quick mouth and determined it would still be a two-story drop even if I was hanging from the end of the rope. I rested my back against the wall and just cried. Freedom was right there, but I didn't want to risk the fall. I could break a leg or an ankle and then have to crawl my way to the parking lot. And then the idea came to me. I thought of the skeleton hanging from the main room. I went over to the mannequin, grabbed him, and slowly but surely dragged him over to the window. He was surprisingly heavy for a mannequin. I pulled the rope up and put the noose back around the mannequin's neck. I started to lift him out of the window when I felt a bulge in his pants. Good sir, are you happy to see me? I said out loud with a laugh. I reached into the mannequin's pocket and found a wallet. No driver's license or bank cards, but it did have $200 in cash, which I took. Oh, thanks, buddy. I'm going to need this for therapy. It's expensive. With that, I gave the mannequin one big push out of the window. I heard a sickening, wet snap. I looked, thinking that the rope had broken, but everything looked normal. I sat on the window's edge, grabbing the rope and slowly stood down it. I got to the mannequin and put my feet on his shoulders. I started with my half-assed attempt at shimmying down him. His shoulders were squishy, but I began to crawl down the mannequin. He was very soft and cold, nothing like he'd been before. Then we got face to face. I looked, and in my shock, I almost lost my grip. He was a real person. His eyes had maggots eating them away, and his head lolled from side to side. I was frozen, looking at the face of this man. This man I'd just killed by hanging him. No, no, I thought. This is just the house playing tricks on you. All right, keep going. Thankfully, I was able to hang on to his ankles, and from there, it was only a four-foot drop. I looked up at the house as it started to rain. Oh, screw you, I screamed, and flipped at the bird. I started walking into the woods then, trying to get back to my car. I felt like I walked for hours with no progress. I was cold, soaked to the bone, and on the verge of collapse, when I saw a warm glow from a small house attached to a greenhouse. As I approached the door... It opened, and an old woman came out. Part 6 Oh, my goodness, she said. Oh, dear, come in, come in. You must be freezing. Where did a little thing like you come from? She wrapped a warm blanket around me. My teeth were chattering. The devil's house, I replied. I was whisked inside by her strong arms, which gave me a little push. The door closed, and she locked it behind her. 
Oh, you poor little thing. I'll put some tea on to warm you up. As the old woman went off into the kitchen, I looked around the small, warm room. Something was wrong. It was definitely something I could not put my finger on, but, well, it all seemed off-putting. Uh, do you need any help there? I asked, trying to be polite. Before I could open the kitchen door, the old lady appeared and said, Oh, no, 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 the tea's already done. She handed me the tea, which smelled wonderful. Now, drink up, dear, said the old woman as she stared at me. Oh, um, I think I'll let it cool, I said as I brought the tea back to my chair and set it on the small table next to me. A few seconds passed, and the old lady quite insistently said, Drink up. Don't let the tea go too cold now. I put the cup of tea to my face. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see the old lady watching me. Her smile curled up just enough that it was off-putting. I put the tea back down and asked, So, um, how long have you lived out in the woods? Her left eye twitched and her smile faltered. She immediately came back with, oh, Well, my whole life. It's just me and my plants. Oh, I do insist you drink your tea now. I don't want you catching a cold. My mind started to race. Plants. Hmm, plants. Didn't the doctor mention something about a groundskeeper? Well, thanks for your hospitality, but I'm actually going to get my car. It's in the parking lot and I just want to get home. Well, as I stood up, the frail old woman jumped from her seat surprisingly fast. Her voice changed from that of a sweet old woman to one of a demonic person. Every word she spoke was dripping with hatred. You can't leave yet, dear. You have to drink your tea. And she ran at me, screaming. I bolted into the kitchen, where I saw a teapot on the stove and crushed plants next to it. Now, the room was cramped, and I almost tripped over the table. I raced to the hallway, took a right, and ended up in a massive greenhouse. I was running down rows of plants, trees, and all sorts of greenery. I saw a man posed in an awkward position with flowers growing out of his finger and a tree growing out of his mouth, his face filled with pain. I passed waist-high tables covered with pots of soil. Each pot consisted of wiggling hands and feet. Venus flytraps the size of a car were taking huge chunks out of a cow that was hanging from the ceiling. There was a chemist station where plants dripped their contents into beakers and test tubes. A sharp pain shot from my calf and I hit the ground. I looked back to see a massive vine wrapped around my leg. I tried to pull it away, but the vine held tight. <sighs> the sound echoed off the glass of the greenhouse. The old lady walked around from the corner, holding a wicked-looking set of gardening shears. I panicked with each step that brought her closer to me. My eyes darted around, looking for anything I could use. My eyes caught sight of a rusty, half-broken, hand-held trowel underneath the greenhouse table. I held it up, and the old lady cackled at me. What are you going to do with that? Make a sand castle? I raised the trowel above my head and brought the sharp edge down onto the vine, cutting into it deeply. A clearish liquid oozed from the cut. The old lady let out a scream, and I brought the trowel down on the vine again and again, furiously trying to cut through it. And then, I was free. I hopped to my feet and took off running. And the old lady was right on my heels, screaming at me. I'll kill you. You hurt my precious babies. I reached the door just as she put her hands on me and pulled me back inside the greenhouse. I saw red and screamed like a cornered animal. I charged at the old lady and swung that trowel at her like it was going for a home run. It connected, and I could feel her old leathery skin cut apart like Christmas paper with a new pair of scissors. The old lady took a step back, more in surprise than anything, and then laughed at me. <laughs> you think that'll hurt me? But she was cut off mid-sentence, as she saw the clearish liquid from when I cut the plant drip from my improvised weapon. In horror, she dropped her shears, took a few steps back, and looked at the cut on her arm. Oh no, 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 no! She ran off in a way like her life was on the line, knocking plants off tables. She was like a possessed woman as she made her way out of the greenhouse. I opened the door to leave, and without a second thought I yelled, 
Get bent, lady. And walked out to the cool fall air. I walked for a few minutes and had to rest. I had shortness of breath and was starting to cough. The pain in my leg was back. I looked down to see part of the pulsating vine still attached to it. When I bent down to pull it off, I noticed it had several spike prongs that had dug into the meaty part of my calf. I let out a cry of pain as I carefully pulled the remaining part of the vine off my leg. I could see the same clearish liquid lightly flowing out of the wound. Oh shit, that's probably not good. I continued walking, well aware of my worsening symptoms. My temperature had begun to rise. I was sweating as if I'd just run a marathon, and I was beginning to stagger. My vision went blurry, and at one point I dropped my trowel, though I can't remember doing so. I saw a small building that resembled a utility shed. I figured if I was going to pass out or die, I might as well be inside. I pushed open the double doors with the last of my strength. It was dark inside. I took one step in and fell down a set of steps. I hit the bottom of the steps and rolled a little. It was dark, with just a few religious-looking candles lighting it. My head was swimming from the poison in my veins and from the fall. I was sitting down now with my back against a wall. It looked like I was in a crypt. I could just make out rows of marble squares with names on them. Then, something heavy fell in my lap. It was a head. A human head. With the last of my strength, I threw it against the opposite wall, where, upon impact, it shattered. What the hell? I thought, scooting forward on my butt. I turned to look at the wall, where there were four more heads. No, they were marble busts, and underneath there were words carved. Start to shriek and harmonize. Grim, grinning ghosts come out too. It was the last thing I read before I blacked out. I woke in a dark tunnel with someone dragging me. My head was bouncing off the uneven surface. I tried to call out, but my mouth was dry, so I groaned loudly. The man carrying me by the leg stopped and looked at me. Oh, good, you're awake. But I need you asleep yet. Well, night, night time. He swung a large stick which made contact with my head, knocking me out. I woke some time later. Not sure how much time had passed, but I couldn't move my arms or legs. My one leg was swollen from where the vine had been wrapped around it. I could hear banging all around me and knew that other people were trapped just like me. The sound of a saw turning on could be heard, followed by a blood-curdling scream. I tried to move, but with the poison still in my body, I could just barely wiggle my fingers. Just then a small door opened by my feet. Bright white light flooded the small space I was in. It was so bright it hurt my eyes. I was pulled out of my small room and placed onto a cart. I was still lying on my back while I was wheeled into a room with three tables. Two other bodies were occupying these tables. I was able to look around, but not much. It was just enough to notice bottles of embalming fluid and formaldehyde. At my feet, across the room, was a cremator. A man wearing an apron was wheeling one person from the table and putting him in the cremator. He closed the door, locked it, and turned the machine on. Within seconds, the person inside started screaming. I could see him kicking at the glass, his skin burning and sticking to the small window. All of a sudden, he went quiet. The mortician sipped on a drink and said, Time to get a fresh one from the back. You two don't go anywhere now. As he left a room, I heard a psst. I used all my strength to turn my head to the side and look at the person strapped down at the table next to me. Hey, you. You're not strapped down. Can you move? No, I can't. I got poisoned or something from a plant. I can kind of wiggle my fingers, though. Just then, we could hear footsteps returning from the back room. Hey, I'm Paul. Look, just stay still and be quiet. We'll figure a way out of this. The mortician came through the door with another body on the cart and placed it on the empty table next to me. The autopsy began. He cut out organs, cutting away chunks of flesh like it was roast beef at a cutting station. The wet smack of this person's liver hit the floor, followed by an oops. Ooh, that might have been important. 
Then there was a scream of this person waking up halfway through his own autopsy. The sickening slurping sound could be heard as blood was pumped out of his body and right onto the ground. The cook of a staple gun being shot into flesh was the sound that followed. The door swung open and a hulking figure stood in the doorway. Meet for the master, its voice boomed. Yeah, yeah, the meat's over there, the mortician said, waving his arms over to a blood-soaked basket. The butcher, now with two different coloured skinned arms, stopped and looked at me. He walked over and started to sniff my hair and my neck. I could feel his skin touching me. Ah, get your meat and get out of here. She isn't ready yet. And the look of hatred burned through the butcher's eyes as he picked up the wet basket of human organs and left, never breaking eye contact with me. The mortician turned to look at me and said, Sorry, he uh, tends to get curious. Sometimes he's like a new puppy, but don't worry, you're next. And with that, he left the room. Stay. Can you move yet? Paul asked. Yeah, man, it takes a lot of effort, but I can do this. I lifted one arm up in the air and held it for a few seconds before letting it drop on the table with a thud. Can you reach the release button for my strap? Paul asked. I can try, I said as I strained and pulled to reach. We could hear the footsteps of the mortician's shoes on the concrete floor. Oh, I strained and wiggled. I was a few inches from the button. I was trying to press it without falling off the table. But my legs weren't fully functioning yet. Just at the very last second, I was able to click the button on the side of Paul's straps and release him. Well, I was able to release the top strap anyway. I just got back into position as the mortician walked right up to me. He leaned in and said, All right, well, since you're still paralyzed, I'll be doing this autopsy without any anesthesia. You can't risk you going into shock. He was about to cut into my flesh when a loud boom rang out. The mortician's eyes went out of focus. There was another loud boom. Paul was standing over the mortician with a rubber mallet. Paul picked up the body, put it on the cart, and wheeled the mortician over to the cremator and turned it on. Paul, what are you doing? I asked. Erica, I've seen too many horror movies. I'm burning the body. Paul took the key off the mortician, unlocked the crematory door, and threw the body in with all the grace of a drunk person building a house of cards. He then closed and locked the door. Okay. We can go now. Just then, screams erupted from behind. The mortician's face was pressed against the glass window, hair and ears completely burned away. A muffled, You think you can kill me? came from the cremator. With three powerful punches, the glass cracked and shattered. The mortician began to pull himself out, his charred and burnt skin cut down to the bone, and there were shards of red-hot glass that remained in his frame. He crawled completely out, and before anyone could react, he picked me up by the neck. I struggled to breathe, and the mortician said something, but with his lips and part of his cheeks burned off, all that came out were unintelligible words accompanied with a perpetual smile that was burned into his face. I grabbed his arms and pulled, but all I managed to do was have his burnt skin slide down to his elbow. Paul ran up and jabbed a long needle into the mortician's chest. Well, the mortician paid little attention to this, and with a free hand, he pushed Paul down to the ground. But the needle had a hose hooked up to it. With a flip of a switch, a small pump whirred to life, and the mortician's blood began to pump out and onto the floor. Within seconds, the mortician had collapsed to the ground as a wet sucking sound continued. Paul helped me off the ground and said, Yeah, now we can go. We exited the funeral home and found ourselves outside in a cemetery. This was the same cemetery we'd passed to get to the house. After a few minutes of walking, we ended up in the opening in the woods. The fire in the centre was still burning. We started walking down the path towards the parking lot. Oh, it's over. It's finally over, I thought. Suddenly, out of the darkness, we heard the growl of a chainsaw. And it was close. I took off running with Paul right behind me. He didn't need to be told to do the same. While well, the sound of the saw grew closer, 
As we rounded the last bend in the path, I could see the parking lot. I ran through the gates and into the parking lot, gasping for air, and I looked back to see Paul just standing there. He was only a few yards from the gate. And then I noticed the chainsaw sticking out through his chest. The blades were still spinning and throwing blood and bits of bone everywhere. The chainsaw pulled out, and Paul slumped to the ground. The demon with the chainsaw looked at me, and then turned to walk back into the woods. A slow clap began behind me, and I spun to see Lucy standing there in his suit. I could hear the sound of a church bell ringing in the distance. Well, 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 Eric. You survived the devil's house. Congratulations. What is your wish? Lucy asked. My wish? I stammered. Why, well, yes, child. Don't you remember? I said at the beginning that the first person who gets out will be granted one wish. So what will it be? Money? Fame? Power? I wish. I wish. I said and pointed to the Victorian manor on the hill. I wish that this place would burn to the ground and never exist. Lucy looked taken aback. Are you sure? You can wish for anything you want. Dead relative back. To always win the lottery. Even to stop world hunger. You really sure? And I replied, without a doubt. Burn that mother down to the ground. Lucy let out a sigh and mumbled something about. Do you know how long it took me to make this place to punish humans? With a snap of his fingers, there was a loud whoosh, followed by a massive gust of wind that almost knocked me over. The heat was so intense that the hair on my neck felt singed. I looked back at the forest and the house. Everything around it was engulfed in flames. Lucy took off his hat, moving in two small horns protruding from his head. He then bowed down to me and said, well, Until next time, Erica. And they took my hand and kissed it. Well, there was no tingly surge this time. I got into my car and drove down the road as the manor burned behind me. I drove in silence for a few moments and then looked at my phone. LTE was back. I tried the radio but only got static. I clicked scan and managed to pick up one channel. It came in with heavy static, but I was able to make out. This is Evelyn from 104.6 FM. Have a safe night and be careful out there. Epilogue I arrived home with the sun already far below the horizon. I was greeted by the sound of happy barking from my two Pembroke Welsh corgis. The youngest of the two is only six months old. He was so excited to see me that he emptied his bladder right there in the kitchen as I walked in. I cleaned up the mess, let the dogs out, fed them, gave them lots of tummy rubs. I took some time to shower and clean up the best I could. I started dinner, spaghetti and breadsticks, when I heard the garage door open and close. My husband walked through the door looking absolutely exhausted. He looked at me and smiled. Hey, did you do something with your hair? He asked. He absentmindedly touched my hair, forgetting it was cut down to shoulder length. Oh, yeah, I just got a trim. I laughed, but I noticed he wasn't wearing his work vest. Hey, babe, what happened to your vest? Oh, yeah, I lost it in an underground lake. It was kind of a sink or swim situation. He chuckled back at me. Well, dinner's ready. Spaghetti and breadsticks, one of your favorites. We sat down and enjoyed the quiet meal. So, um, how was your day? I asked. Well, I fought some Native American demon monsters in the mine today. How about you? Oh, sounds exciting, I replied. I think I met the actual devil today. Well, we leave a pretty exciting life, don't we? We both laughed, happy to be safe at home. That was a pretty cool one to start the week with, wasn't it? Oh, perfect for your Monday evening's entertainment. All right, I hadn't done a proper long one all in one go for quite a while, so I thought I'd treat you all with that one. And what a story it was. Really loved doing that one. Lots of excitement and a bit bloody in places, but, well, yeah. 
So, yeah, um, Meat Locusts is finished. I've recorded it. Just ran out of time to edit it and get it all ready for last night, but that is coming. I've definitely finished recording it, so don't panic. It will be coming next Sunday. And I've been promising that for like a month now, but it's done. Um, I just couldn't have a chance to put everything together for yesterday. Well, oh, exhausted after that one, as I always am with these longer ones, but hope you thought it was worth it. Well, back again soon. A couple of podcasts coming up this week, because I'm getting a bit behind with those as well. So there might be one tomorrow and on Thursday. Well, enough for one evening, though. So till the next time, my dear friends. Oh, actually, it was nice to be in a story as well. Evil doctor, wasn't he? Yep, so until the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.